Okay, folks, this serves as a learn to play on any of the, the games within the, uh, the Red Poppies campaign series. The rules are basically a system set of rules. Not everything is in this module. I'll cover a few things, but it'll serve you in good stead for all the ones. This is the uh, third one we have here, the artillery assault or assault artillery one that involves the French versus the Germans later in the war. I'm going to talk about the some of the units, talk a little bit about the module, a little bit of a learning curve with any module. Hopefully you'll be able to pick up all the uh, the important stuff here. We'll talk about uh, the map, some of the terrain, and to the body of the uh, presentation will be a rather artificial scenario I've set up with a mix of all different unit types to show uh, mechanics and situations and stuff. I think this game is really good with the campaign game where you're playing the long game multiple scenarios trying to uh, move forward or defend your line depending on which side you're playing uh, that's when the game really comes alive so i have a bunch of units on the map the blue french are over on the left hand side there's a few more of them we'll scroll down and talk about them in a moment but we'll talk about, and the germans are over on the right basics about scale 200 yards per hex 10 minutes per turn for a scenario scenario could be six turns could be up to about 12 turns. So you're talking of a short period of uh, intense operations. Even the campaign game, you do multiple scenarios from day to day, even night ones. Units, well, this is a grand tactical game. Most of the units are infantry companies, gun sections, mortar sections. Some specialist troops like the flamethrowers, etc., may only be sort of platoon level. But if you look here in the, uh, the top left-hand side, and I'll do the old map flare. This is a French infantry company. It has two sides to it. The front side is the one over on the left. It's the uh, 32373. And on the right hand side is its corresponding dispersed organization. So we have formed and dispersed. The next unit down is a machine gun unit. You know, probably like two heavy machine guns supporting personnel. That has in its form side. It's basically non-deployed. It's, uh, it's limbered up. It's been disassembled. It's not in place. And on the, uh, the right-hand side, there is its corresponding dispersed side, which is basically it's in place. And you notice the factors change. More obvious there for a machine gun, where look at the red numbers there on the top of the right-hand corresponding unit, where it uh, top right is its firepower value. And it has no firepower value when it is in its form side. It has no movement value when it's on its dispersed or its you know, deployed side. The infantry is the meat of the game. Most of the units are infantry. I say it represents a round a company. Of course, that changes across the war as what that actually represents from 250 blokes with uh, you know, bolt action rifles early in the war. Later in the war, it may be half that number, but there's a large amount of embedded uh, automatic weapons, uh, rifle grenades, hand grenades, uh, and some other light weapons that are all factored into the uh, that company as a maneuver unit. The Germans, if you talk, com contrast to compare, especially in this module, there's only one type of French infantry company. And by type is, look at the factors. There are two types of German infantry. The top one is their Angriff, basically their uh, assault troops or their troops that they use to uh, counterattack. And the lower of the two over here is their Stellung, which is their blocking fortress ones who would be used to hold ground, while the better quality troops would be used to retake ground or take ground. Okay, and you notice there the factors are quite different. German firepower on that top, uh, the, the Angriff company is a plus four, but it's only a plus two on the Stelling company. The scenarios tell you which ones to use. Just note that although they're both infantry companies, they are slightly different coloring in the box and the numbers are different. That's important when it comes to activation. If you're trying to do, uh, for example, like an activation of a mass of units. 
Uh, it's easy to tell which side is the dispersed side or the deployed side because the morale is in the yellow box. So you look at center bottom of each counter. When it's on the dispersed side, you notice there's a yellow box around it. And on some units, it goes up compared to their uh, formed side, especially some of the good infantry or the uh, machine guns. So have a quick talk of what the numbers are. Top left of a unit is its firepower. And that varies from not able to fire with a dash, could be a zero in some of the other games, up to plus four or five, depending on um, some of the specialist units in the other series. Same numbers, same place in all the games. Hot right is its range in hexes. Sometimes units don't have a range. There's a flamethrower unit we'll talk a bit more about in a moment, doesn't have a range. It's only good for melee. And I'll just show, just jump down there. There's the flamethrower unit. Notice there's no range in the top right. It is only good for melee. Then we have in the middle at the bottom, we have, trying to get the correct name, the cohesion number. Probably call it morale. Higher the better. Because you're going to be doing cohesion checks where you're going to be rolling against that number. And if it fails, bad things happen. Lower left is movement. This can vary from nothing with a dash up to three or, uh, I think, three or four. I don't, there's no cavalry in this module. There is cavalry in the, uh, the first two games. They will have, of course, higher movement. And on the uh, bottom left-hand side, we have the melee number. This could be have an underline. Underline means there's a, it's reduced when against AFVs. There is some tanks down there. They have boxed melee. Above the melee in the mid on the left-hand side is the anti-tank value, which so tanks can fire against tanks. And you'll also see, for example, the field guns. They have a boxed anti-tank figure, which means they can fire against tanks. But some of the other units can't fire against tanks, like the infantry cannot fire against tanks, but it can do a melee against them. We have mortars. So here's a mortar unit. We have artillery. Notice it has the uh, right-hand side is the form side, not deployed. And on the left hand is the disperse side, which is its deployed one. And we have uh, machine guns. Of course, we expect to see them on a World War One game. And uh, the French here have a flamethrower, very good melee value. They also have engineers. And they have two types of tanks, the uh, Schneider and the uh, saint -Fermont. And you can tell them apart. They look very similar. Notice the Saint Clement has got a red movement value. That'll come into effect when we uh, talk about movement and bogging. When you set up a scenario, you choose which side you set up your units on, whether they are set up on their form side or on their dispersed side. Don't forget, dispersed can also mean deployed, which is uh, important for getting the best out of uh, some of the fixed weapons. Notice that the tanks cannot move when they are dispersed. They have no movement value. So you want to set them up onto their form side. So that's an example of all the units that are in this particular module. Some of the other modules have uh, more units, different units, they have cavalry. This is the only one that has tanks. So let's have a brief, uh, brief talk about the map. And I'm going to go and zoom out now and hide all the units. So this is the whole map. It has got a couple of trench lines, French trench line in blue, Germans, multiple lines, uh, depth, defense in depth. Those are the, uh, the black trenches. There are no wires on this map. It's on the terrain effects chart, but it is not on this particular map. That's because the, uh, the Germans are not that well entrenched. There are of course, some woods. Notice the woods have a dark green dot in the middle of them. That tells you that it's a woods hex that will block line of sight. And notice that there are green bars in between the, uh, the hexes. That is a um, heavy woods that can cause people to get lost while walking in them. Not all the woods have the green dot. For example, this hex here. 
there is woods on a corner of it, but it is not classified as a blocking woods hex. There are towns. Notice the, the, the black line around them, showing that it's blocking terrain. Lots of trenches with lots of craters. So you notice that there are trenches and there are crater figures showing that this, uh, these have taken rather a lot of artillery fire in the past. And there are other hexes like this one here that do not have craters. So you're looking there as to what, what is in the, uh, the hex as far as the terrain. As far as elevation is concerned, this module, this particular game does only has, I think, four levels of elevation. The, uh, the second module has something like nine or 11, a lot more hills and woods. And then going over here, we have uh, okay, a couple of rivers and more tanks. So terrain is an effect. It does affect line of sight. Lighter is higher. It's the easy way to remember it. So just quickly covering some of the line of sight rules. If you get an obscure one, I would have to say read the rules in detail because I have to sometimes read them myself to make sure I understand it when you have different elevations, etc. Just to make sure you do it chapter and verse. The basic thing is, you know, there is a line of sight tool in this module that if you are trying to do line of sight, and if I do an example here with these woods, the green dots show that it's blocking terrain. So if the line of sight goes across blocking terrain, it's going to be blocked. Even though there's a slightly different elevation there, it's blocked. Same with the towns. If you're going to do line of sight, and you're, you're, you're in this example here, where it's blocked on one side, not blocked on the other, that's fine, you still have it. That's not blocking, because it's open on one of the sides. And if it covers a hill and you're on the same elevation, it will block line of sight. So this is the normal sort of things people are dealing. These weapons here don't have a massive amount of uh, uh, range. So line of sight can be very uh, important at times, but normally the basics are, are good enough to understand them. Like here, for example, both of them are on the same level. It covers over a slightly higher so line of sight will be blocked in that case. The other line of sight issue is what's called hindrance. The simple rule of hindrance is if you have two hexes of hindrance in between, then line of sight is blocked. At night, every hex past one is considered hindering terrain. So at night, you can only basically see two hexes. And there's rules there for if you do night, uh, night attacks. But it really makes you understand why night attacks were actually quite effective in keeping guys alive. So what I've set up here is a sort of an example of a couple of battalions of French supported with some tanks and some other heavy weapons versus about a reinforced battalion of Germans on a trench line. If I hide all the units here, you'll see the blue trench is the French and the gray trench here is the Germans. And we're going to basically be doing a French assault on a German line. We have one of each type of unit. So everything's going to get uh, used as an example. And we have a little bit of hill down here in the lower portion, but we're only really working on this part of the map. So you, everybody should see nice and clearly. I purposely set this up to be a bit annoying for the, uh, the Germans, because if you look here, the trench lines are only one hex apart. While over here, there's a little bit of a gap between the two. There's a little bit, this is no man's land. Yes, there's rules for no man's land in the game. Basically it's not controlled by either. And the idea here is the French want to come over from the left to the right and kick the Germans out. Seems pretty reasonable. At the beginning of a scenario, the players can choose how to deploy their units normally. By that, I mean whether they want, they want to be formed or they want to be dispersed. They say guns, they, they perform better when they are uh, dispersed. And what does dispersed mean? Well, dispersed means you're, being, you're in more open order. You have deployed your equipment. But dispersal or being dispersed is also an effect of combat. When somebody does combat, the first thing it does when you fail a cohesion check because of combat, you will become dispersed if you are not already dispersed. And so that's an important part of things. If there is a machine gun unit that is not deployed and it's in the middle of the open and it gets fired on and it gets an adverse reaction to the cohesion check, then it will become deployed.
Therefore, if you want to move it again, you're going to have to form it back into its uh, form status and then move it. That's going to cost activations, as you will see. Let's get down into the meat. It's a turn-based game through each turn. There's a resolution of what's known as command couplets. Each side will get command couplets and they will alternate doing activations. Those activations will be used to move guys or do actions with them. They will choose which one to do. Those units will become spent. Basically means they're activated for that turn. Then they'll go over to the other guy and they will do an activation and they'll go back and forth until all the command couplets for that turn have been spent. And only then will an administration phase take place where those units that are spent will become available for the next turn. So basically one activation per unit per turn. Big asterisks there for machine guns, which we'll talk about. So let's go and uh, do some command couplet uh, rolling. We'll go through and do some example activations. We are going to go and roll first of all to see who gets what number. So it's basically a Unless the scenario has some special rules, you're just going to roll 1d6 each. So this is going to be the roll for the Germans. Germans roll four. French rolled four. Great. Brilliant example. They rolled the same number. Normally, you work out who rolled the highest number, and basically they've got initiative, determines the number of command couplets. If you roll the same number, it goes to the Germans, and the Germans get three command couplets. If you roll a tie. Okay, so I'm going to put the number there on German. Germans have initiative. They will take the first activation. Germans can go first. Yes, you can pass. Good question. Nobody asked. They can choose to pass. By passing, basically not activate anybody. But what I should have done first, yeah, got ahead of myself. I should have deployed my units. So let's go back and do my, uh, do my deployment. So I've got to decide whether I'm going to leave my guys dispersed or formed at the beginning of the game. So let's go through and do something that's sort of intelligent. I am going to deploy, I disperse that mortar or that machine gun. I am going to disperse that guy there. Tanks need to stay formed because they can't move. Um, and on the German side, I am going to deploy them. There's a machine gun here. I'm going to put them into a blockhouse. And I'm going to disperse them. A blockhouse is basically a pillbox. It's using old, old world terminology. Only machine guns can go into blockhouses. It's an extra strong. It's better than a trench. This unit here is going to, going to go into trench. Uh, where is it? There it is, in trench. Now, here's an important thing about trenches. You've got to be in them to use them. It costs you movement points to go in them. So all these guys in trenches are going to go and I am going to set to entrench. The only one who isn't going to be in a trench is going to be the machine gun, which is going to be in a blockhouse. Blockhouses are better. Um, and at the back here, where we have a German gun, probably a seven, you know, one of their 77 mil howitzers, they are going to deploy. Yeah, I'm going to deploy them and I'm going to put them inside the trench. Guns can go in trenches. Tanks cannot. And those there, they are going to go into there. Um, in trench. There's no shortcuts on this module, which is a bit awkward. All right. The infantry here, I'm going to personally leave the infantry as formed up. And that'll come into play in a moment. Here is my lovely uh, flamethrower unit. We will disperse them, but I will leave the infantry in forum status because that will make a sense at the moment. I have another French company over here. We've got a little bit of reserves in the town. We'll leave them as they are at the moment. Um, and we have a couple of tanks here. Remember the red movement factor here on this tank? That's the Saint Clermont. They're more prone to bogging. That'll come in when we come to movement. I think that is good enough to get us starting. We've done the command couplets. The Germans will go first. So the question here is, do I want to fire? Okay. If you do an action, you are normally spent. That means you're not doing anything else for the rest of that game turn. Well, what could you do on a game turn? Well, of course, you can move. You can fire. You can dig foxholes or you can dig uh, trench tops. 
you can remove uh, bomb stops, you can call in artillery, or you can change from formed or to uh, dispersed or vice versa. That's an activation. And that's what you're going to be doing that turn. So if you fire, then you won't be able to do opportunity fire. So you have to decide whether or not you're going to go and commit somebody to do a fire and try and get the first shot in, knowing that uh, the only way they're going to defend themselves would be in to they get into close combat. So it doesn't seem actually like a good idea for the Germans to do an awful lot at the moment. I do have a mortar here. I mean, I could try and ping the French. One of these French uh, stacks over here with the first shot. That might be a useful thing to do. But I, I will actually, the Germans will decide they're not going to do anything. Over to the French. When you activate units, you've got to decide what type of activation you're going to do, how many of them you're going to do. For an activation in the command couplet, what can you do? You can do one unit. Just pick a unit, activate them. And they're going to be set to spend afterwards. Or you can do a stack of two units. They could be different units. Remember, the only thing that's important here is these units have not they must be ready, i.e. they're not already spent. One activation per unit per turn. So I could just go in, okay, I could just do this stack and I could activate both these units in the stack or I could activate just one unit. Or, okay, well, let's start getting a little bit more clever then. The big one in the game that's different is what's known as a mass. And a mass is a whole bunch of units of the same type. Up to 12 units in up to six contiguous hexes. So if, if I just rearrange these stacks a little bit, you'll notice that this type of French infantry are in a whole bunch of them in a row all the way along this trench line. But did that on purpose because I could activate them as what's known as a mass. They have to be the same type, exact same numbers. So mixing two different types of infantry will make them was not a valid activation. Every one of the type, they have to be in adjacent hexes in a line. So this is like telling a whole regiment to go forward. They have to be formed, i.e. none of them have to be dispersed. So it might have been a good idea to shoot with the Germans there, because if they manage to disperse one of these infantry units, they will break this chain of adjacent units. Up, it's up to six hexes, up to 12 units in up to six hexes. So actually have, I think, seven hexes in a row, one, two, three, four, five, six, actually eight hexes in a row. So I cannot activate all of them, even though there's less than 12, it has to be a maximum of six hexes. So I could activate, say, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and say down to here, all part of one activation. All right? So your choices, straightforward. One unit, a stack of two units, a mass of up to 12 in up to six hexes, all of the same type. You could do a, um, off-map artillery, or you can do a blob. Blobs are not in all games. They represent uh, infiltration tactics, guys like stormtroopers and assault troops, etc. I'm going to do something a little bit clever. I'm going to shoot first, actually. This activation, I will fire just with this mortar. Yes, I like the unit. And I am going to try and take out this machine gun. Because if I can take out the machine gun, that will give the French a bit of ability to move and not take too much shot. So let's be clever and try and take them out. How do we do combat? Well, I'm going to do fire combat. Fire combat has two types. You're either firing against an area target, which is all the non-tanks in a hex, or if you're firing against a tank, you fire against one tank unit. So it's either everybody in a hex, or everybody is not tank in a hex, or against a tank. I am going to fire against this hex here. With this mortar here. And we'll see how it goes. What's the range? Well, the range there is got three hexes. It's clearly a line of sight. There's the, the line of sight. It's three hexes. What's the range of this unit? This unit has a range of four. That's the number in the top right. So it's within range. The factors that affect a shot are, of course, the firepower versus the defense of the, uh, the enemy. Is there line of sight? Yes, there is. The range of three. They're on a hill here, but it's just on the top. It's just on the uh, the lip of the hill. The other things that affect it, if I go and get the, uh, the play aid. So this is the terrain effects chart for the game. 
It is not in the Vassal module, but this uh, tells you what the defense is. If you look over here, we have a, this guy is in a blockhouse, which is up here, which is minus four if it's in a trench. Well, what does in a trench mean? Just because a unit is on a trench hex doesn't mean it's in a trench. To actually be in a trench, it actually has to be inside it. It costs a movement point to move in there. If you if you go into a trench hex during movement, every movement cost in this game is one movement point. Very simple. Woods one movement point. Trenches one movement point. Everything's one movement point. Very simple. But it costs you a movement point to go into a trench. So if this French unit over here, it goes to move one to there, one to there. It's still not in the trench because it has not spent a movement point. Spend its third movement point. It will go in the trench. Okay. Same with a uh, what's known as a blockhouse for the machine gun here. It costs a movement point to go in it. We deployed in it at the beginning of the game. Didn't have to spend the, the point. It is in a blockhouse. The other unit in the hex is in the trench. Firepower is three. Range is three. Firepower degrades with range. As opposed to the other games where you have that, you fire at full ability all the way up to a point and then you stop. In this game, Firepower degrades with range. And if we go and look at the play aid and go up to the, actually it's on the, we can get out of the module. This should be readable. Okay. This is the reference card. When it comes to doing a cohesion check, basically like a morale check, things are broken down into different groupings. You take one effect from the grouping. So there's a fire, melee effects, movement effects. Other circumstances, like is it deployed, is it moving, what the range, what the terrain is, what the visibility is. You take one from each of those categories when it comes to firing. So we're doing area fire. We have a firepower of three. We're not doing melee. Nobody's doing any movement. Other circumstances, is the target formed? In this case, nobody is formed. Shooting at a form target makes them more liable to take damage. Positive modifiers are bad. Negative modifiers are good. Is there movement taking place? Fire against somebody who's moving, as far as infantry is concerned, non-tanks, is bad for the target because they're moving. Range. Minus one for every second hex of range. Minus one at two hexes, minus two at four hexes. Firepower degrades, except for artillery. Firepower degrades with range. So it's a three firepower. It's a range of three. So it will drop down by one point after two hexes. So two or three hexes is dropping by one point. So it's a plus two. So that's a, that's a positive modifier to affect the morale of the defenders. What they have in their favor. Let's just open up that stack a little bit more. And all I'll do is I'll move these off so we'll see them both. Firepower of plus two, more modified to plus two. This guy has a morale of eight, and he is in a blockhouse. What does a blockhouse do? If we look at terrain, a blockhouse is minus four if somebody is in it. And it says there, reminds you, only machine guns can go into a blockhouse. So minus four to the firepower. So the net effect of that is plus two, minus four is minus two to the dice. For the machine gun unit, eight is the magic number. So I'm going to roll two dice and I rolled five. Minus two is three. Three is less than the uh, cohesion number. The machine gun is perfectly happy. Now we do the infantry. Now infantry is slightly different when it comes to they are in a trench. So we have trench over here. It's normally minus three for anybody in a trench. But versus mortars or howitzers, it's minus two because of the, uh, the trajectory the, with a vertical arc. Our firepower is the same, plus two. Defense of this is minus two. So that cancels each other out. So we're basically rolling against morale of seven. And let's see if we can ping the uh, infantry. And of course, I rolled six. So the infantry are happy. And there we go. This guy is now spent because he did his shot. And I just activated him in the hex. All right. What was the chance of me pinging the, uh, pinging the artillery, uh, pinging the machine gun? Not very likely, but I had a chance. 
and roll really high. Now, the magic number we're looking for in this game when we come to fire or melee is 11. If you can, if you have a modified roll that is 11 or higher, the guy dies. Only when it comes to a fire or a melee roll. So whenever you're doing a cohesion check and it's a normal cohesion check, you're just whether or not it's a pass fail compared to their morale or the cohesion number. When it comes to fire or melee, if you get a higher enough hit, you can actually uh, kill them. You got to have a bunch of positive DRMs in order to get that. Okay, so I took a chance with them. That's perfectly good. Now it's back over to the Germans. And I think once again, the Germans are sort of waiting to see what's going to come from this. Because, of course, if we fire now, you won't be able to reaction fire. And it's always best to reaction fire against somebody who's moving and preferably coming towards you in uh, a big mass. I go back over to the French and I haven't been moving the command couplets down, have I? Getting ahead of myself. So Germans took the first and the French took the second. Back over to the Germans. We're going to go back over to the French. It's going to be the last command couplet of the turn. Do I go in with the big attack with the French? Yes, let's go and do it. I am going to do a mass. One, two, three, four. I got to do six hexes. This is going to be a bloodbath, but it's going to show you what not to do. So these, these top six are going to be activated. And I'm going to do some... Let's see if the Germans can, uh, can ping me. And we'll see how good that machine gun is. So this guy is activated. This guy, this guy. Let's move that stack around. There we go. Down to here. These six are all activated. Remember, you can move, fire, dig, call in artillery, um, or cancel artillery as a activation. This guy, actually, I'm going to do this guy is going to move first. And only if you, if you can say I'm going to activate them, but unless you actually do an action with them, they're not spent. So you could sort of decide. I'm not going to do them. You can, of course, pass. But I am going to go and move this guy here, and we're going to see if uh, they're going to get lucky, because here the front lines are very, very close to each other. Let's zoom in a little bit. So we've got a French infantry company going against the reserve German infantry who are entrenched, and they're barely 200 yards apart. This could end up bad. Okay. There is an, an order of operations. If you get into a situation where multiple things can occur, Rally, Lost, Melee, and Reaction Fire are the order. So if I can get into the Hex and he doesn't get shot at, I could perhaps get into Melee before he shoot me if the guy deserve, you know, decides to, uh, to hold back. Remember, if you do Reaction Fire, the guy doing the Reaction Fire is normally spent. There's an exception for machine guns, which we will find out in a moment, which makes machine guns very powerful. This guy is going to move into this Hex. That costs one movement point. One of his three, that is a reaction fire trigger. Doing certain things is a reaction fire trigger. If you fire at somebody, they can reaction fire back at you. Movement is definitely a reaction fire trigger. I'm moving in there. They are not in the trench. They have not spent the movement point to go into the trench. Every time a movement point is spent, that's a cause of reaction fire. Now, okay, who can I fire with? Well, I could fire with anyone, any of these guys around here. I could even fire with the machine gun. Do I want to fire with the machine gun? They are one, two, three hexes away. They're going to be slightly degraded. They have a maximum range of five, but I'm not going to take the risk at the moment. I'm going to hope that this infantry company here can deal with them themselves because they're in the same hex. The other guy is moving. The other guy is formed. That's bad. That's all negative things for the guy doing the movement. So he's going to fire. He has a firepower. Remember that it's at the top right, plus two. You can fire against other people in the same hex. You cannot fire out of your hex. If multiple people were moving, then this guy here could not fire out of his hex. He could fire at the enemy in his own hex. There's a weird exception there for mortars. If they fire on their own hex, they can hurt themselves. Everybody else just can fire at... Uh, fire other people in their hex without uh, affecting themselves. So there is an exception in the rules for mortars about firing in, into your own hex. So he's going to fire at a range of zero. So his area of fire is firing against all the enemies one at a time. You cannot combine fire. You cannot combine melee. You do it individually. Okay, so he's plus two. Uh, movement. So let's go to the other circumstances. So the category here, so only apply one modifier per category. So he is formed, so it's plus one to the firepower. 
he is uh, an area of fire versus a target that's moving is another plus one. So we're plus four now. Range, same hex, plus five. Um, terrain of the hex. Now, although this is a trench hex, it is also a crater's hex. So those people who are not in the trench get the benefit of the craters. And a crater is uh, minus one, if I remember correctly. Look over here, where's craters? Craters and scrapes, minus one. A scrape is basically a foxhole that people can dig. You do not have to spend points to go into a crater or a scrape. You're in it naturally. So minus one. So you've got a little bit of defense there for being in terrain that's already been chewed up. So if you remember, we were plus two, plus three, plus four, down to plus three on the dice, and we're trying to beat the French cohesion of a seven. This is going to be bad. I rolled a 10. 10 plus 3 is 13. What's the magic number there? The magic number, remember, for fire or melee is 11. So that unit is dead. That whole company is out of combat. But that guy did reaction fire, so he spent. Let's carry on with this example and uh, work out whether or not uh, charging across open ground is a good idea when you're in formed rows like this. So this guy is the next activated. He is going to move to here. Now, can you fire over your own guys? You cannot fire over your own guys if they are uh, infantry or cavalry. There's just too many of them there to, to fire over them or fire through them, should I say. So who should I fire this time? I mean, I could uh, fire with the mortar or fire with this infantry company. We are going to fire with the machine gun. Show you what happens with machine guns. So this machine gun here is plus two firepower and it's a range of two. Remember there that firepower degrades with range. So it's a range of two, so firepower down to plus one. So we have the uh, plus one for the firepower modified by range. The guy's in, he's moving, he's formed. He is also in a scrape. Firepower gives you plus one. He's moving, makes it plus two. He is formed, makes it plus three. He is in a scrape, takes it down to plus two on the dice. Plus two on the dice, I'll do the roll. And I did two and a three for a five. Five becomes seven. Um, I think equal is got to be higher, isn't it? Got to be higher than in the cohesion number. So the guy is okay. Now it's important you look at both the numbers, even though you're adding them up. If the numbers are the same, so you roll doubles for machine guns, the machine gun is spent. So every time you fire a machine gun, if you roll doubles, the guy is spent. Otherwise, he's not spent. So this infantry company survived that. Now they're going to carry on moving and they're going to go into, let's go into here. That's their second movement point expenditure. Still got one left, they can go into the trench. If they have one left, if they're still alive. If they fail the cohesion check, their activation ends. So if they get pinged by opportunity fire, then they're going to stop. Um, the machine gun can fire again. Now the range is closer, so he's at full firepower because he's only at a range of one. So it's plus two for the firepower, plus one for formed, plus one for moving, minus one for they're getting the benefit of the, the craters there. So uh, two, three, four, down to three, plus three on the dice. And I got nine plus three is 12. None of them were doubles. That guy's dead. So you can see here that this is a bad way of doing things. There's two infantry companies just out of the game, just like that. So the next guy over here, this guy's going to try and do something a little bit clever. He's going to go dispersed. So he's basically going to change his formation for his activation. This guy here, he's going to try shooting over here at this guy. So that guy there is spent. This guy is going to try shooting. I'll mark him spent now to remember to do it. He's going to fire at the infantry company. Firepower of three, range of two. So that will knock it down by one, down to two. The infantry in a trench is cohesion check versus fire. Yep, minus three. So he's three down to two. So it's basically minus one off the dice. So he's going to do minus one. And I rolled eight down to seven. He only just made it. That was close. And I could have made them duck. That'd be really cool. Get this guy spent. What happened if he'd have failed? You fail. You go dispersed if you're not already dispersed, and you will go spent. That means if you spent, you cannot do opportunity fire. So you might just want to blast away with your guys and hope you get a few uh, few units ducking 
get their heads down to reduce their effectiveness. I think we're actually going to end that activation there because this is not looking so good. But for the hell of it, I will disperse this guy here and they'll get spent. At the end of the turn, all the spents go away and remove all the move markers. Everybody is available again. We go to the next turn. We're going to roll for the German command couplets. One dice. They roll a five. And the French roll a one. So Germans get initiative. The difference is the number of command couplets. So we have a five and a one, so the difference is four. So we have four command couplets with the Germans going first. Now at night time, you, you normally do a modifier of minus one. There's less likely to be activity at night. Um, if you're using the infiltration rules, if the scenario says it's an infiltration scenario, they get plus one, i.e. there's more activity. Um, and what you tend to find is you either have too many command couplets or not enough. You never have the right amount. So, Germans again. Well, we saw that uh, running across no man's land was not a good idea, but we got all these French units here that are sat out in the open. Perhaps... Uh, Let's try and mortar somebody and see what happens here. Let's try and break up some of these formations. So this guy here, I think I'm going to, as there's less French in front of him now, I think he's going to do some mortaring. Remember mortar? That is only a, uh, a plus two defense against the guy in a trench. So the mortars are actually quite effective at trying to uh, to pin guys in trench. But I did not put these French in trenches. They're out there in uh, they're not in trenches. They are almost they're lying out in no man's land in in what they call uh, Russian saps and stuff. So these guys are uh, well, this guy's actually in in open terrain. So that's a good reason for uh, deploying your units at the beginning of scenario. So this guy's going to fire. He's going to fire over here on this machine gun. Plus three is the attack. Minus one for range. So it's down to plus two. The guy is not formed, he's not moving, so it's just plus two. So I just do a fire. Plus two is eight. He is okay. Oh, I just can't hit anything, can I? I either kill him or they're, they're happy with it. So he's going to be spent. Move it over to the French side. Who's that there? All right, so I'm going to have to get a little bit clever with trying to, uh, to take out this, uh, this machine gun nest in this blockhouse here. Because there's an infantry company supporting them. Let's see if we can get a tank into the action. And over here we have a Saint Clement. Got three movement points. Notice he's got a red movement point number. He has to, he's more prone to bog checks. Now this game's got some fun mechanics uh, as far as bogging or getting lost. If you're moving in an enemy trench, from an enemy trench to another connected enemy trench directly, you can get lost. You do a cohesion check. If you fail, your guy's spent. They're spending too much time getting lost in all the uh, communication trenches and all the, the angles or they're clearing dugouts or there's uh, still some enemy resistance left. The same with woods. If you're moving in a woods, you can get lost, which could just bring your movement to a, to a halt. Uh, you only do one loss check per turn, first time it occurs, but it can really screw up your flow when you're trying to move down an enemy trench line as you're clearing it, when all of a sudden your lead company suddenly gets a little bit uh, confused about which direction to go in because of all the, uh, the switchbacks, the trench lines. But we are, we're going to use this, we're going to try and use this tank. So we're going to use a Saint Clement, got a better movement than the, uh, the Schneider, better factors, but it's got the red movement number, it's more likely to bog. So if you move into a trench, so I'm just going to activate this guy for the com French command couplet, just one guy. Remember, one guy or a stack of two or a mass of 12 or a blob. He's going to go into there. He's moved into a trench. He has to do a bog check, which is basically a, uh, a cohesion check. I'm going to roll the dice, roll a seven. He's okay. He's going to move into craters. Same thing there. Now, this would occur before reaction fire. So he's going to be going, and I'm going to roll again, and I rolled a three. He's happy. I've got one movement point left. Do I stay? Because I can't melee them. I might just move them there. Oh, but oh, look, there's a German gun over here. Let's have a look at the line of sight for this German gun. He's over there. Let's do a line of sight. I'll clear the uh, stuff off the map. Now that guy is in view because the line of sight doesn't touch that hill. When he was back over here, the other uh, line of sight was blocked by the hill. When it was back over here, 
the line of sight clip the edge of that heel. That's thus blocking it. So now this guy is in line of sight. Let's fire against him. This is a different type of fire. This is AFV fire, which is basically against a single unit. This guy's got an anti-tank number. That's the number in uh, the, the second number or the middle number on the, uh, the left-hand side. It's plus five. It's pretty good, but this is a 77 millimeter howitzer. They were very useful as anti-tank guns back then. Uh, range is one, two, three, four, five. Well, range is in effect. Remember, minus one at two hexes, minus two at four hexes. So it's minus two. He's down to a three. Still plus three on the combat. The guy's got a good cohesion number, but it's uh, he's a moving target. How does a moving target affect shooting against the tank? I'll have to look at the reference card. Now, against tank, it's the other way around. Minus one anti-tank fire versus a moving target. It's harder to hit a tank when it's moving, easier to hit, hit uh, infantry when they're moving. Five, down to three, down to two, plus two on the dice. Um, but there is terrain, there are craters. This guy is probably bumping around as he moves over this ground. So he gets terrain effects. So this ends up being a plus one. And I hit a seven, he's perfectly happy. That guy did his opportunity fire. Oh, I marked, marked him as spent, there we go. Got one more point left for this guy. Remember, every time it spends a point, you can do reaction fire. Could reaction fire with the machine gun, but he's a minus one. The infantry can't do anything. This guy's another infantry unit. He's no good against him. I might have to wait till next turn to have a ping with him. That was my best chance. Now I got one more point left. I could move him onto the trench line. Um, what's the melee number like for these two? Well. The tank is melee number. Of course, melee is the uh, the lower on the, uh, the left-hand side. He's a plus four. This infantry unit here is a plus three with an underscore. Underscore is minus one for melee against uh, tanks. So he's only a two. Any unit, even if they don't have a melee number, or if they, if they don't have a, 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 an anti-tank number, can still melee against the tank. They just have to get up close and very personal. I think I will move this guy in. Now we have to do a bog check because he moved again onto a trench or a crater. You only do one of them on the hex, even if it has both. So once again, we're doing a cohesion check. Does he bog? And I rolled a nine, which I think is just okay. I've been rather lucky on my uh, cohesion checks. So that guy is in that hex. He's happy. And the Germans are a little bit scared. Is there anybody else there I could do any opportunity of fire against? And the answer to that is not really very effectively. I mean, the machine gun could, but uh, I don't want to take the chance on rolling a, rolling doubles on a, on a low chance of pinging him. I have to use the uh, mortar or the artillery next turn. All right, he's spent. So you can see here, tanks are pretty good as long as they don't break down. All right, over to the next command couplet. I'll move it down, put it onto the German side. So what does the German decide to do about this? I mean, I could... Uh, I suppose I could melee him, but that may not be a good idea. I think I'll have to wait to see what he does. Yeah, that tank could be rather useful if he gets his acting gear. Now, what I uh, might do actually in the back over here is I have a couple of Angriff companies over here. These are the uh, the better guys. And we talked earlier about infiltration tactics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this guy up to here inside the trench. So he's still getting all the benefits. And I mark him as spent. And that would be my activation. And you're wondering, why do you want to move this guy to there? Now, okay, the other type of activation that can occur is known as a blob. And a blob is a uh, British terminology that was used for, uh, uh, that's used in the game for a group of people. When you have infiltration tactics, you can activate a blob of four dispersed adjacent units, regardless of type. So as long as they're ready, they're available for activation, and they're dispersed, they can then be activated. This is the only time you can activate um, units of, a, of different types in multiple hexes. Because normally you're just doing guys in one hex, or one guy, or a whole bunch of guys who are connected together of the same type, that are all in nice good order. So the infiltration tactics help to uh, give you more flexibility in activating guys in later war scenarios where there are the uh, infiltration tactics are available. So I'm going to move them up there to get them adjacent to, if, in case I need to activate them. Remember, the Germans are really, really good at counterattacks. Next thing, 
French command couplet. All right, I think we need to get moving in the south here. Do I want to take the risk with this lovely flamethrower unit here? That would be a great one if I can get him into the line. They got good morale. Let's try and uh, distract them, I think, by bringing up another tank. He's only got two movement points. And I'm going to use this guy here. This guy is going to move here. That's one movement point. Reaction fire. I could fire with, the, uh, with any of these three German units. So let's use the guy who's in the same hex. It's probably not a good idea. He's two firepower. So two firepower. Guy's moving. Guy's formed. Guy's in the same hex. So that's plus five to the dice. Minus one because of the crater. So plus four. And I rolled. Yeah, I killed him. Yeah. Okay. All right. So as you can see, it's not a good idea. I should have probably just fired. I think I'm going to end the, uh, the French activation there. Let's skip over to the, uh, the Germans. Germans are just going to sit back and let the French come. Let's try and uh, soften up the French. So this guy here, he is now, this is a dispersed guy. Let's see if he can work a little bit better than the formed guy. All right, he's coming in. The guy in the hex is going to fire. He's a two. Guy's moving. Guy is not formed. So he is only up, he's a two up to a three for moving. Same hex up to a four down one because of being in craters, being in the hex. So that was only a net plus three. Come on, let's get some luck for the French. No, well, dead. All right. I can't even get good die rolls when I want them to go, go good. They don't go bad when I want them to go bad. They don't go good when I want them to go good. That's the way it goes. Okay. All right, let's keep it moving. And I want to try and get this, uh, this flamethrower in there. All right, so last command couplet of the turn for the, for the Germans. Oh, that was the French, yeah, but the Germans. Uh, I'm just going to pass, and let's go over to the French. Let's fire with this machine gun. So this is going to show you machine gun fire against the stationary target. That going to make them spent. Range of two, it's going to drop them by one because of the range. The guy's in a trench, that's a defense of three. So he's a two down to a one, down to uh, minus two off the dice because of the uh, net minus two. And rolled seven, yeah, that missed. So as you can see here, it's very, very hard to ping guys who are in trenches who are in, oh, actually it was plus one because they're formed. But even so, having a formed guy in a trench, he's not likely to get hit very, uh, very easily. All right. Quickly move on to game turn three, roll for the Germans. I want to cover some other things. Germans roll a six, French roll a four, difference is two. So there's only two command couplets, but once again, the Germans have an issue. But at least we got a French tank in the fun position. So let's fire with the artillery over here. Put them on top of the stack. Okay, range one, two, three, four. Sorry, right, range of three. So it drops his firepower down from five down to four. Guy's got defense of one down to three. Three on the dice. All right, I'm not getting any luck as the French, am I? Everything is just dying. Because it's 11 plus three is dead. As you can see, this is not how to attack. I'm not even getting any luck. All right, let's cover some other other little gotchas while we're at it. Digging, etc. Because the French here are like this attack is failing. Let's set up an example. Let's say, for example, this lovely uh, flamethrower guy managed to get into this trench. What can the Germans do about it? Well, the French guy can now move along the trench and get the benefit from the trench, even though he's moving. What can the Germans do about it? Well, one thing you can do as an action is dig. So we are going to dig. So I'm going to put a dig marker against him. So his activation would be to dig. He's spent from doing a dig, and that's all he can do for the turn. He's basically getting his shovels out and digging stuff. Let's say this guy is not yet spent. I want to do a proper melee. So if this, this guy was able to be activated, he is going to come along the trench and come in. Now, he is in the trench already. So when he comes in, he is still in the trench. He doesn't have to spend a point to come into the trench. If you're in a situation where there is a melee occurring, 
you can spend a movement point to come into the trench and do a melee. So from movement point, you can move a hex, you can cause melee to occur, you can move into a trench, or you can move into a trench and do a melee at the same function. In here, we're already in a trench, we're moving in. So actually, you'll take opportunity fire and moving into the uh, moving into the hex. And let's say the, the uh, infantry fire, they're pretty strong there. Two. Moving is up to three. The guy is not formed, but the guy will get the benefit of the trench. That's the real kicker there. Get in the trench, move along the trench. So two, three for the same hex, four for moving, so plus one on the die roll. There we go. Say the guy survived opportunity fire. And now he can spend a movement point to do a melee. We're going to do a melee at last. And I'll move these guys out of the way. So melee is basically one to one. You do a matchup. The attacker does a matchup, picks a unit. That's the one they're going to melee against. And the defender does it. So it's normally a one to one matchup. Here we have a two to one. So both the uh, the Germans can uh, can uh, can uh, melee back. They will do it individually. It's simultaneous though. So what I really want to do is I really want to knock out this uh, this machine gun. So the French unit is going to melee against the uh, machine gun. He's basically kicking this. Going to roll his numbers. The same thing applies as with normal a normal cohesion check caused by fire, except we ignore terrain. So the French unit is plus five. The uh, German unit is dispersed, so he's not formed. There's no movement for the Germans. So plus five. Target user makes cohesion checks for the massive value of all units attacking it. This is the only time you get a multiple unit attack. So this guy is going to be plus five against him of a morale of eight. Yeah, infantry unit. Are, they're very good. So nine plus. Five, that's more than enough to get 11. This guy's toast. The machine gun's toast. Cool. That's what we wanted. We're going to fire back, though. They have a they have a melee of five. Um, so plus five. He's probably going to die in the process. And I rolled a nine. I'm rolling really, really high today. So he's dead. And importantly, the machine gun's dead. So that flamethrower team did their job. I rolled high enough. That firepower of five in melee is very, very cool. It's getting them into the hex is the problem, as you can see. So with that imp with that machine gun out of the way, things have opened up an awful lot. When they do opportunity fire, there's a lot less of them available. Remember, they do opportunity fire, they're going to stop. Only machine guns are ones that can, can keep on doing reaction fire until they roll doubles or until there's nobody left to shoot. The key thing is definitely understanding what groups of people you can activate. Single unit, stack of two units, massive up to 12 and up to six X's, all of the same type, all of them formed. And of course, uh, blob is the exception that's only in some of the scenarios. We were talking about digging. Okay. And I was setting up an example for dig. So we're going to zoom in here. And oh, look, some lovely Frenchies have managed to get into the German trench. Well, if the Germans do a dig action, that will activate them. They'll go spent. In the admin phase, at the end of the turn, after everybody's taken all their actions, that this guy is probably spent getting in there, you can finish the dig and deploy the dig uh, effect. You have two things you can do here. Of course, if you're in the open, you can dig a scrape. A scrape is a foxhole. They're available up here in the... Uh, that's the same as a crater, minus one for a terrain. It's not the same as a crater. Tanks will not bog in it, but that's foxholes. The other thing you can do is a bomb stop. And bomb stops, of course, are really cool because a bomb stop is basically a, a break in the trench line. By digging a bomb stop, that means this trench is no longer connected. For the unit to be able to go into this trench, they have to basically come out of the trench doesn't cost anything to come out of the trench but it was cost one movement point to come into there they are not in the trench they didn't have to survive any reaction fire then spend a movement point to go into the to, to melee into the germans in the trench or if they can remove this german they can then do the dig action themselves you can only remove a bomb stop so also known as trench gates basically they collapse the trench they fill in the trench 
they they fortified the trench to to break the trench line such that uh, the uh, the attackers cannot come in can't just walk along the trench line that's one thing you can do with a dig action you can also dig scrapes you can uh, you can also remove a bomb stop so if we're in a situation later on in the game where this French unit here managed to get an activation and they do another dig and it comes around to the uh, the admin phase in the admin phase they can then turn this dig action and remove this bomb stop but you can only do that if the there are no enemy units on the other side of the bomb stop so bomb stops are a directional break in the trench that uh, stops people moving along the trench and it's really cool when you have bigger scenarios when you start getting people into your trench line waiting for the inevitable counterattack, and the, the trench lines get broken notice on most of these germans here they have multiple lines of trenches some of them are very very close to each other defense in depth definitely proves well briefly talk about artillery there's pre-game artillery preliminary bombardment is either a pulverizing or a paralyzing i.e the change tactics as they did later in the war when they went from trying to kill people by a bombardment to where they're more trying to neutralize people there is off-map artillery, even though it's called off-map artillery, because of the ranges and the, some of the weapons involved, they actually may be on map assets that are just not arrayed as counters. So the units you have here are basically doing direct fire, essentially, self-spotting. So even the artillery here, they are doing uh, direct fire, being controlled by themselves, as opposed to being controlled by forward observers. It's called off-map artillery, OMA for proper bombardments with larger formations of batteries etc and there's different types of artillery there's gas which is more of a neutralizing effect but there's also creeping barrages the major factor there if i get the reference card is to do with method of transmission and delays big effect of world war one was command and control was very difficult so this mode of transmission table controls the time spent and the possibility of, of success where it comes to doing artillery so anybody can spot if they have line of sight or any infantry can spot if they have line of sight depending on what the scenario has defined of what type and strength of artillery it is and what type of transmission normally it's telephone uh, trench set basically means a trench radio which were very large cumbersome and static at the time the advantage of course of the trench set they're not affected as much by, well, they're not affected by a, a preliminary bombardment. Telephones were notoriously affected by lines being broken by, uh, by preliminary bombardments. But there's even flares, as well as aircraft spotting, representing balloons and uh, spotter aircraft. Important number is this for signal success is the number, of course, uh, higher is better because you want to roll uh, the number or lower. PB fired is if there's preliminary bombardment. And RD is the delay. The relay delay is how long would it be before the information will get back where you even have a chance for the artillery to go off. Uh, the artillery templates in this games, uh, if you do a right click, you can actually get an artillery template. It's uh, three hexes, has to be centered around the, a vertex. So you could do something like that or, you know, array it as you see fit. It can be rotated to uh, to change the shape the key thing is the delay now thinking about uh you know this this stuff is defined in a scenario flare is normally some sort of pre-deployed uh, or predetermined artillery response that when you flares are fired to certain colors the guys know that they need to do a particular defensive bombardment or offense or offensive bombardment so the delay is is only uh or the artillery will be available immediately with a delay of zero but the runner that's when you're sending guys back that can be delayed up to uh, six turns so you're gonna put the uh, the template out on the map you can set it to a different number depending on what number and type of uh, artillery is available within the scenario it'll tell you the value of it and how many of them it could be say two batteries of value three so okay this is going to be b i'm going to put this on the turn track so find french marker b and i'll put it same worst case a runner six turns ahead one two three 
or five, six. Eventually you'll get round to this turn. Eventually it'll come round to this turn. Then you can actually see, oh look, B is now available. The guy has hopefully gone and talked to the, uh, to the, and B is now available. Well, then you have to roll to see if signal success is good. Now, did it actually get through? Did it actually get communicated properly? Now, as you know, there's always a chance like where you might change your mind. So uh, one activation you can do is to call in artillery, another plot an artillery strike, another one is to cancel it, but that takes an activation using that one of your command couplets. If you cancel them, because you say, okay, well, this area might be controlled by me, at that point, perhaps I don't want to bring down my artillery on my own guys. You can do a cancel off map artillery uh, activation. And you have to roll to compare to the signal success. Remember, six success, signal success here for, say, a runner is very low. You have to roll a four. If you do badly and you roll uh, an 11, then that thing goes ahead instead of you canceling it, which uh, it's always fun when that happens. Artillery is, is slow and imprecise and not to be very effective, but is not easy to control in this game. If you're at a situation where that artillery barrage has actually come due through its time, then when you do an activation, you roll and you see if you do, see if that actual bombardment goes off. This doesn't cost an activation. You do this before you act, do a normal activation. And you're going to roll your signal success number to see whether or not that actual uh, details went through correctly. And if you roll it, great, you resolve the uh, as another uh, area fire attack. Tax everybody in the hex, including tanks. That's an exception to the to the area fire rule, because remember tanks are normally fired at as a direct fire against a single tank unit. But it tax everybody in the hex, friend or foe. And if you manage to roll the signal success number, which is very dependent on the mode of transmission. If you fail, well, next turn you can try again. So it could go off. So artillery is in the game. It's not, it can be very effective. It is not guaranteed. This is not uh, modern day where artillery is, you know, on call and fast and effective and accurate. There's also smoke. Smoke is hindrance. Um, and there's also gas, gas causing people to have uh, cohesion checks. It is not a major part of the game. It's in some of the scenarios. Best use of artillery in this is in the preliminary bombardment when you hopefully you soften the guys up beforehand, like you proved they needed here. A couple of more things to cover. We covered line of sight. Infantry and cavalry block line of sights unless the guys are in trenches or blockhouse. So yeah, you could fire over your own infantry, your infantry or machine guns, etc., if they're in trenches. The game also has form of extra forms of transport, mules, wagons, and trucks, more useful in the bigger scenarios in the campaign game. You want to move a long distance. So mules and wagons just give you extra movement. The scenario would define how many you have. You could be something like uh, wagons two. That means you have two uses of wagons during that scenario and you'll get a movement bonuses. Well, this is World War I, so movement is not easy. Mules are pretty good. They only give you an extra two movement points. They're not affected adversely by terrain. Wagons plus three movement points, but cannot go into anything that's cratered because horse-drawn wagons. There are also trucks. Trucks have to stay on roads. They move a long way, but they're on roads. But, well, this map, for example, does not have a lot of roads. This is not really a roads map unless you're the Germans over here and you're doing some scenario where you're, uh, you want to move from, say, one town over to here. Not at all useful really for the French because they're down here and uh, they have, that's the only road down over here on the French side. The key to this game is how to break into the lines. If there's a preliminary bombardment, you see an opportunity, you might want to rush it. Otherwise, slow and steady, firepower, and hopefully you'll get a, an opening rushing across no man's land in nice columns like this. Not a good idea. I almost got lucky with the tank. That does add another tactic to the game. Even though these tanks are uh, are slow, they got quite a bit of firepower. Just as long as the Germans don't sight their um, field howitzers that uh, nicely. And I cannot think of anything else I really need to cover. I think I'm done.